This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Lightning Talks. We've got 13 excellent uh, researchers to come and present the latest scholarship in 18th century studies, and I'm sure we're very much looking forward to it. Please do feel free to tweet today's proceedings. Um, if you want to, you can use the hashtag IHR Seminars, and uh, then that means people who wanted to be here but can't come here can follow on Twitter. I've, I've had a few requests over the past few days if we'll be tweeting today. So before we actually begin, I'll just do what I'll just copy what normally happens at these sessions and ask if there's any announcements. <coughs> None this time. No? 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 Fantastic. I'll then, we'll, next time. <laughs> then we'll just get straight into it. Okay, so our first researcher is Kathleen Reynolds from Durham. And she researches the relationship between women, the household, and healthcare in the early modern England. In December of 1782, Dorothy, Duchess of Portland, wrote to her cousin Louisa Ponsby regarding a matter of mutual interest. She said, your letter is rather comfortable than otherwise, as it tells me that all your kindred have nearly recovered their indispositions. It is high time, for you must have been long ago tired of that melancholy trade, nursing the sick. I open with this anecdote because it highlights many of the features that I'm exploring in my PhD. I'm investigating the role of Northern English women in household health between 1600 and 1800. Who they nursed, what they thought of their actions, and what these actions entailed. Household remedies have been well researched, but there's still space to understand what the role of woman as caregiver was in the home. When I was reading through the literature on women's medical roles, almost every author references that it is common knowledge that women were the primary caregivers in the early modern household, that women were expected to nurse the sick. And being a slightly contrary person, I began to ask myself where that common knowledge came from. In a way, this thesis is a response to my own question. I've gone back to the sources to see what exactly women were saying about their role as nurses in early modern England. I begin with the concept of woman as nurse, using nursing the sick as a case study through which to explore the conceptual terms that will frame my thesis. I mind the primary sources to see what women describe themselves as doing in letters to their families and in diaries and memoirs. Next, I integrate a broader context by looking at popular assumptions about women's medical work seen in advice literature in medical books marketed towards the household, and the sickbed in popular novels. <coughs> Having established the parameters of nursing in the home through the works of female nurses and through popular literature, I focus on three themes of household medicine, authority, gender, and external aid. I'm very interested in the issue of how women perceive their authority as nurses. One of the ways that I investigate this is through examining the status that women ascribe to themselves in illness narratives. I'm also testing the difference between what women did and what they talked about doing by comparing illness narratives within letters with the contents of recipe books. I also test ideas about masculine behaviors by looking at how men emerge as household caregivers and correspondents. Finally, an important feature of household health is that it rarely remained a self-sustaining system. Severe, unknown, or prolonged illness necessitated moving out of the home in order to call on other trained medical pr practitioners. I'm examining how household health related to external physicians and what the process of calling for help entailed. This thesis will fill the gap made by assumptions about gendered medical tasks and provide a solid local case study of women's informal nursing work. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is Anna Field from uh, Cardiff. She's researching early modern crime through emotional history. <coughs> Off you go. Hi, um, I'm Anna and my project is Intimate Crime in Early Modern England and Wales. Um, I'm mainly exploring the cultural context and the extent to which commission of serious and petty crimes altered the close relationships between ordinary people. So some historians of crime in the long 18th century have equated intimate crime with domestic crimes committed by women that threaten the patriarchal order, such as petty treason, scolding or infanticide. However, these crimes were very rare and exceptional. Um, seeing intimacy solely in domestic terms is inadequate because it neglects to consider the role of intimacy in other kinds of crime and other types of relationship. So what exactly was intimacy? My interpretation has two parts. The first is the physical closeness of bodies, so the environments in which people worked, and the second is the emotional element of intimate relationships. 
Um, of course, it, it's hard to identify and measure intimacy. Um, so I'm influenced by emotional historians such as Barbara Rosenwine, Thomas Dixon and Brona Kane for informing the kinds of methods that I use. Um, the sources will be mainly manuscript, pre-trial legal documents and printed crime literature. Um, textual references to speech and gesture will be mainly what I'm, I focus on. Um, of course, we have to remember that these aren't actual emotions, they're um, representations crafted by the various genres of, of the sources. Um, furthermore, in the 17th and 18th centuries, the word emotion actually meant a physical movement rather than an internal state of being. Um, so emotions were more likely to de be described in humoral medical terms such as passions or, or the like. Um, so my definition of intimate crime is a crime which subverted or changed already established intimate relationships shared by a group of people in a specific cultural setting. And these settings can be visible, for example a household, um, or they could be conceptual and much larger such as a gendered or, or regional group of people. Um, so what I want to share quickly with you today is an example of a serious violent crime where physical and emotional harm was caused by a stranger who deceived someone with a false sense of intimacy, which is what I have termed an intimate persona. Mary Harris was found guilty of uh, violently robber, um, robbing Hester Parker in 1741. In her testimony, um, just there, Hester said uh, that Harris forcibly picked her up and threatened her with a knife. Um, there's a verbal rejection to being picked up because she didn't recognise Harris as, as someone who knew her mother. Um, the child perhaps associated this physical gesture with the intimacy and trust that she shared with her mother. Um, after Harris had committed the robbery, she offered the child a bun in sort of an imitation of a reward given by a parent, perhaps. And these are the kinds of dynamics that I want to explore in my research because they warrant a lot further explanation and they're very instructive for considering the different kinds of intimacy and uh, emotion in 18th century crime. Uh, three minutes on the spot, well done. <laughs> Our next speaker is Emma Purcell from Leicester. Emma researches elite women and the management of great households. Um, so I started my PhD in January at the University of Leicester and it's a collaborative doctoral award so I'm working with Boughton House, a country house in oh, Northamptonshire. Yeah. So, sorry, um, I'm working with my PhD with a country house in Northamptonshire, Boughton House, for the duration of the project. Um, by opening up the archives to the house, the original focus of the project was to discover how the house was managed in the 18th century, by whom, how it interacted with local tradesmen and built networks of supply and demand in the local area. However, it quickly became clear that to focus solely on Boughton House and the, um, for the project wouldn't be viable, and so I opened the project up to consider how the network of properties owned by the Montague family was run, um, who was making decisions on everyday management and purchasing for the houses, which properties were stayed in the most and why, and what happened to other pro uh, the properties that weren't being resided in. Um, Boughton played an important role in this network, but needs to be considered along with the other properties of the family including Dalkeith Palace, Bow Hill House, Drumlangwood Castle, all in Scotland, um, Dean Park in Northamptonshire, Ditton Park in Berkshire, as well as a selection of London-based properties, including Montague House, Bloomsbury, which is the site of the British Museum <coughs> today, Montague House, Whitehall, and a further villa out at Richmond. These are just some of the 25 properties owned by the family by the turn of the 19th century, but all played a different part in the lives of the family through different generations across the 18th century. Due to the prominence of the Montague women during this pa uh, period of the family's history and the lack of studies connected to them, as well as the lack of studies of women's roles in country houses beyond statements such as it was women's roles to run the households, I am specifically investigating the role of elite women in the management of a network of properties. I'm taking a case study approach to the research to find out more not only about how the households were managed, but also the Montague women's roles in the management of these households. The three women I'll be focusing on are Lady Mary Churchill, daughter of the famed Duke of Marlborough, who married John, second Duke of Montague, um, uh, as a young teen, and for whom little archival material remains at Boughton, but who so far appears to have had little interest or input in the management of the properties. Um, her daughter... Lady Mary Montague, who married the Earl of Cardigan and who was later created Duke of Montague. And finally, Lady Elizabeth Montague, who married Henry Scott, third Duke of Buccleuch. 
content from her account books, personal correspondence and letters to her London house steward, John Parker, between the years 1809 and 1812 reveal her precise and specific instructions on, a matter, on matters of decoration, repairs to be made to properties, instructions for servants and her unhappy dealings with tradesmen. Thank you. Up next we have Daniel Reid from Oxford Brooks. Daniel aims to reappraise the functioning of the Anglican Church in the north of England up to 1750. As has just been introduced, uh, the aim of my investigation is to reappraise the functioning of the Anglican Church in the north of England during the first half of the 18th century. This will be achieved through an analysis of ecclesiastical administration and patronage within the northern province, with particular emphasis on the life and career of Lancelot Blackburn, Archbishop of York from 1724 to 1743. Revision of the legacy of the church in this period can be traced to the work of Norman Sykes and then principally to his church and state in the 18th century. This has provided the bedrock for subsequent research as undertaken by historians such as William Gibson and Jeremy Gregory. The binding theme that will give structure to my investigation is that of the clerical profession as elucidated by W.M. Jacob in the clerical profession in the 18th century. To be an Anglican clergyman was to be part of a recognisable profession which was regulated, supervised and carefully organised. In selecting an individual as the focal point for the thesis, it has been crucial that their historical biography be treated with sufficient scrutiny. Lancelot Blackburn's legacy is currently blighted by persistent slights against his character, some of which arose in the generation after his death, but were reinforced by Victorian pessimism towards the state of churchmanship in the preceding century. One such accusation is that missionary service undertaken by Blackburn in the Leeward Islands in the 1680s involved a dalliance with buccaneering. Groundless claims of this kind arise more from a conflation of 19th century prejudice and the romance of the golden age of piracy than any sensible assessment of the state of the church during this period. This historiographical neglect of Blackburn's tenure as Archbishop has led to a disregard of some aspects of the functioning of the Northern Church during the 1720s and the 1730s. This thesis aims to rectify this by testing Blackburn's record as Archbishop in a manner akin to Judith Jago's aspects of the Georgian Church, which addressed the governance of the Diocese of York in the later period of 1761 to 1776. A greater appreciation of factors such as transferred nepotism and the effect of ill health amongst bishops will be central to this reassessment. This study will go on to survey different modes and outcomes of 18th century ecclesiastical patronage as illustrated through three further case studies of key recipients of Lancelot Blackburn's preferment, namely Joseph Atwell, Thomas Hayter and Jake Stern. The varied career trajectories of these individuals will allow for the exploration of potent themes such as family, the legal system, the influence of the universities, electoral politics, and interactions between Anglicanism, Catholicism, and other dissenting groups. To achieve uh, my aims, um, a particular use will be made of neglected archives in the north of England, including material from the local record offices of the Three Ridings of Yorkshire, the Hull History Centre, York Minster Library, the Borthwick Institute, and the special collections of the universities of Durham, Leeds, and Nottingham. By returning to the primary source material uh, without lingering traces of Victorian pessimism, a richer depiction of churchmanship in the north of England during the 18th century will hopefully emerge. And up next is Alistair Noble, who is, you're at Edinburgh now, yes? I am, yes. yes. He is at Edinburgh, and he is researching post-45 perceptions of Scotland and the Highlanders. Thank you. I'm talking on representations of the Highlands and the negotiation of the Union, 1745 to 60. And at the start of the 18th century, the, the, at the time of the, the Union, the Scottish Highlands had was seen by many within the, within the United Kingdom as a distinct and separate region, a status which was reflected in the Act of Union, which maintained uh, some of the region's separate legal characteristics, for example, the maintenance of, of heritable jurisdictions. And um, this visual aid, which I'd, I'd hoped would come out a bit clearer, uh, the, the map uh, does sort of uh, hopefully show uh, the, the sense of the, uh, the military map shows the, the sense of the, the, the region as a very sort of distinct and separate part of the, the United Kingdom. Um, the, uh, and a series of rebellions at the, uh, the start of the, from the start of the 18th century, culminating in 1745, cons confirmed the suspicions of many uh, that the region was barbarous and lawless. And subsequently, some historians, such as Divine, have argued that this perception, which was underpinned by contemporary and enlightened ideas, help justify the government's repressive measures and the accompanying widespread, re widespread reforms uh, which followed the, the, that last rebellion in 1745. But is the picture more complex? Certainly the Highlands were perceived in this way, but a more detailed understanding is needed. Who asserted the view of the Highlands as, as lawless and, and for what purpose? Was it contested, and if so, by who? 
The reform of the Highlands after the rebellion should be viewed, I argue, in the context of the constitutional struggles that developed during the 18th century, which had been left unresolved at the, at the time of the Act of the Union, and also the long-term economic developments, which went, meant that a number of parties with different perspectives had an interest in Highland reform. These included, for example, the Board of Trustees for Fisheries, Manufacturers and Improvements in Scotland, under the auspices of the, the Duke of Argyll. Uh, therefore, research into these different perspectives, using government papers, papers of the agencies and individuals present in the Highlands, but also travel writing, can demonstrate that there was not one single contemporary account of the Highlands, which, underpent, which then went on to underpin brutal attempts at, at pacif pacification of the region. Instead, I hope to demonstrate that while there were, ma were many within the British government and the military who saw the Highlands as bar barbarous and uncivilised, this narrative was contested by competing interests who put forward different accounts of the Highlands, such as a narrative concerned with improvement rather than pacification, and, and, and presented a more nuanced view. These different representations reflected the differing views of how Scotland should be governed and the status of the Highlands with, within a United Kingdom, and they were central to the negotiation of that status and negotiation of Scotland's uh, relationship with the Union. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, Jimmy Latham from Selwyn College, Cambridge. And uh, Jimmy is researching the changing role of uh, print culture in the clerical profession. Okay. So uh, religion has assumed uh, an important place in recent histories of 18th century England. In particular, recent studies have sought to locate the established church in its broader social, cultural and intellectual context. In this vein, my project is examining the relationship of the clergy to the press and print culture in Hanoverian England. The clergy were prominent participants in a wide variety of forms of public discourse through their sermonizing, lecturing, and to a significant extent, their printed publications. <coughs> Since the restoration, the print industry had undergone rapid expansion and commercialization. In increasing numbers, the clergy turned to printed forms of communication that allowed them to fulfill their religious role as agents of what historians have called the Long Reformation, that is, to promote religion, educate the laity in the Protestant faith, and refute error. At the same time, however, the clergy's role as authors and commentators in the public sphere was neither fixed nor assured. With the lapse of the Licensing Act in 1695, many of the lower clergy were mobilized to publish in defense of the church as the end to prior censorship was seen to have given a much more prominent voice to those that of whom opposed the interests of orthodox religion. Uh, moreover, a range of political and religious controversies created a highly partisan atmosphere during the last years of the reign of Queen Anne. Taken together, these factors contributed to an explosion of clerical publishing rates in the first decades of the 18th century, particularly amongst the lower clergy. The focus of my project, however, is to look at how this role changed after the Hanoverian succession, where statistical evidence suggests a significant decline in clerical publishing during the 1720s. This decline, however, was not terminal, and clerical publication rates would stabilize by the 1730s, though they would never reach their previous heights. Such shifts were accompanied by a significant move away from the kind of popular polemical writing which had defined clerical publication during the reign of Rage of Party. This shift away from a fierce, controversial culture of print, however, arguably acted as a stimulus to creative endeavor, and my project is looking at the various efforts of clerical literary circles to continue the aims of the Long Reformation whilst moving past the partisanship uh, which had deprived defined previous generations. In particular, I'm looking at the ways in which clergymen uh, may, uh, in which clergymen made innovative and experimental use of the periodical press, poetry, and devotional literary forms. And up next is Emily Addison from Leeds, who is researching the life of the composer William Shield and his lasting musical heritage. How do you find out what people really believe in and care about, what they identify with? One way is to listen to the songs that they sing. People throughout history have used music to tell the stories that they're passionate about. So popular songs aren't just um, catchy tunes, they can be witnesses to movements in history. William Shield 
was someone who understood and harnessed the power of a good song to attract and please audiences. You could think of him as an Andrew Lloyd Webber of the late 18th century who composed what we would call <coughs> musicals. You may never have heard of S.H.I.E.L.D., but I guarantee you may recognise this tune from one of his shows. Shout out when you know what it is. It is, yes, mm. thank you. Which we, of course, know with the words of Robert Burns' poem. Um, most likely, neither Shield nor Burns composed that tune. It was probably an older, traditional melody. And many of Shield's works were based on folk songs like this one. Um, he and his contemporaries called these national airs, which hints at potentially a political as well as a commercial and aesthetic reason for using these tunes in his works. Perhaps his choice of Scottish, Irish and Northumbrian airs could reflect um, the diversity within what was still just becoming the United Kingdom at this point. Could also be an attempt to foster a collective sense of British identity against threats of invasion from Europe. Shields' works also link musical style with social class. Uh, simple rustic airs are sung by honest peasants operatic arias demonstrate the refinement or the extravagance of aristocratic characters. Shield himself experienced the whole range of Georgian society. He was born in an ironworkers village in the northeast and ended up being intimate with the royal family. Was he just trying to represent the established social order or actually did he intend to challenge it by filling theatres with music of the people, most notably the French revolutionary anthem, A Saira. My thesis will show how Shields' works can give us insights into 18th century ideas of national and social identity which still have repercussions for us today. And I also hope to explore how his story might inspire people now to express their own concerns and ideas about our society through music and drama. Thank you. Up next we have Hazel Tubman from Oxford who is researching 18th century consumer practices, yes. particularly the pocket diary. Okay, um, so this project was prompted by a broad interest in 18th century British consumer society and a slightly, slightly narrower interest in the way that people responded to new opportunities to consume. I wanted to pursue a more agent-centred approach to look at how individuals, specifically, manage their spending habits. And I started, as you would, with personal papers, throwing myself into local archives and looking for all sorts of personal papers. And it was purely by chance that I came across and then kept coming across this format of pre-printed journal. Um, so pre-formatted, commercially produced diaries started to be published in 1747 and were popular in the second half of the 18th century and the early 19th, and indeed today. Um, and the diaries, by and large, um, looked like this. They were small, pocket-sized, they cost around one shilling and sixpence, and were divided into three sections. So the first 20 pages provided a directory of useful information, so tables of interest, lists of MPs and uh, peers, um, and information like that, and there's an example there. Um, and the second section offered 52 pages ruled for the diarist to enter memorandums, accounts and observations. Sorry for the quick switch. <laughs> Just ask me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, generally they followed this format, and it was this that made them unique. They were the first sort of pocketbook to have such a structured space and to combine accounting and diary keeping in this way. The final section was around 100 pages of more lists and instructive information. This information was wide-ranging, offering advice for the gentleman coming up to London and tips on how to cure canine madness. Mm -hmm. However, importantly, a recurring theme in this content were essays on personal economy and diligent self-accounting. Now, of course, these themes would appear. It's a form of advertising, and they're promoting a standard of behaviour to which these diaries are an invaluable aid. However, the more I explored, the more it became clear that they drew on a language of economy, self-improvement and financial self-management that appeared and was prominent in the popular print at the time. Existing histories are vague in teasing out the link between these diaries and the social and cultural mores that they demonstrate, however, and this is where my research hopefully will come in. I'm um, aiming to do two things. So firstly, I'm looking more closely at the content and the spatial organisation of the format of these diaries, as I believe they can tell us a lot about what was seen to constitute effective and responsible self-management on the part of the individual in the 18th century. 
And secondly, I'm, looking, I'm aiming to look at the ways that individuals used these diaries and responded to these messages of responsible self-accounting, because the quantities in which they were sold and used suggests a growing appetite for this form of self-monitoring and for the structure that they provided. So that's kind of the main thrust of the, my research. I'm treating these diaries as a point of access to broader ideas of responsible consumption and money management and as a meeting point between these culturally ordained notions and individual responses to them. And I'm looking at their production at this particular time and comparing and contrasting them with earlier forms of self-writing, so almanacs, commonplace books and accounts ledgers, to see if and how they changed the way individuals kept track of their time, their money, their selves and organised their affairs in the context of broader cultural commentary. <laughs> well done, well done. <laughs> and now we have Rosie Wayne from Bath Spa. And Rosie combines politics, gender and textiles in her research of British political culture. Oh, you go. Uh, my research is fairly interdisciplinary in nature as it seeks to forge new links between uh, the history of gender and politics as well as with material culture and historical archaeology. Uh, I hope to be able to employ a social reading of textile objects by using um, artefacts, uh, visual art sources, as well as textual and manuscript materials um, to try and <laughs> uh, to address this idea of political needlework and dress made and bought by women in this period. Uh, whilst there has been work done in recent years upon women's artistic or domestic use of textiles, the possibility of textiles being used as a form of political agency, uh, even indirectly so, as a form of <laughs> has been scantily researched. Uh, additionally, existing work tends to focus upon the early Tudor and Elizabethan period, or upon the 19th and 20th centuries, and the 18th century context has been largely ignored. Um, beginning with the Restoration um, in 1660 and going through to the um, <coughs> accession of Victoria, 1837, my research highlights political milestones in the long 18th century and explores the textile material context which underpin them. Um, such milestones include the Restoration, the Glorious Revolution, Jacobite Rebellions, the American and French Revolutions, the Regency Crisis and the abolition of slavery. Um, as an example of my current focus, allow me to briefly explain the use of the following textile artefacts associated with the Jacobite Rising of the 45. Um, discussion of women's involvement in the Jacobite cause tends to focus upon romantic figures such as Flora MacDonald, who rescued Charles from the Isle of Skye after Culloden. However, um, nameless contributions um, of the needle, such as this embroidered pincushion from the Metropolitan Museum and the uh, linen cockade from the National Museum of Scotland, as well as battle banners, commemorative fans and stuff. I think that they really show women's vested interest in this and they've been drastically underused as resources. Also, there's the importance of tartan, which has been used in a very fashionable way, but not in a political way. Uh, this wedding dress by um, Isabella Fraser from 1785 was made up of tartan predating the Act of Prescription and um, was made after the Dress Act was repealed in 1782. I believe this points to the fact that um, the family held on to the fabric during the time, during the time that, the, um, that tartan was banned. <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent. Well done. Thank you. And up next we have Carrie Ann Griffiths from Liverpool. And as part of the Digital Panopticon project, Carrie Ann is researching fraud and embezzlement in the Old Bailey. Okay, so I'm going to be, uh, my focus is predominantly the prosecution and the sentencing of fraud at the Old Bailey between 1757 and 1868. Firstly, why am I looking at the Old Bailey? Um, practical reasons, it's still the best uh, comprehensive digitised criminal uh, resource that we have. Um, also, because of the jurisdiction, it's both London and Middlesex, so from a financial crime point of view, I should get a good sort of cross-section of, of society, but also different types of prosecutors. The time frame is shifting a little bit. Um, I've said 19th century, but actually now I'm going back to uh, 1757 because it's in this year 
that we see the um, common law of cheating becoming a statutory misdemeanour, but also, and more importantly, uh, where obtaining property by false pretenses uh, is properly fully criminalised uh, and also becomes a uh, felony. In terms of the later date, it's because I'm trying to look at a wealth of different types of sentencing options. So I'm, I'm going to end when transportation ends, which is in 1868. This date might get put back uh, depending on how much information I, I end up looking at. In terms of what I mean by fraud, obviously this is a category of offence. It's not an offence in and of itself. So when we're trying to trace the law, I mean, it really is scattered across the common law and across statute, across a number of... Um, well, really from sort of Edward II onward. Um, so I've ended up looking at things like uh, obtaining uh, property by false pretenses, false personation, cheating, uttering of false documents, uh, but also overlaps with larceny, larceny by a trick, and embezzlement. The reason that this is particularly important, this area, and why I've chosen to look at it, is there's surprisingly little work out there and the work that has been done tends to focus later in the 19th century. People like George Robb are really looking at company-related. And people like Rob Sindel, when he was looking at white-collar crime, they take it from a very class assumption. They're looking at middle classes. That's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to look at this area um, of offences in order to challenge this idea that white-collar crime, financial crime, is middle class, um, but also to see how offenders are treated um, Essentially, it, it should be a good uh, mix because you can have false pretenses by servants or you could have sophisticated, fraudulent promotions of companies, but under the same offences, so it's a good um, cross-section. Just, I just thought I'd put up my research questions. Um, so I'm looking at what is fraud. I, I'll just keep going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at what is fraud. Um, I'm looking at who's committing and then I'm really making a distinction between who are the victims and who's prosecuting. Because we know in other offences like coining, you get professional prosecutors. So I want to see if these are lay prosecutors or, or professional. And then just taking it all the way through to treatment. Oh, sorry, treatment in prison <laughs> or transportation. And up next we have James Fisher from King's College. He's researching the meanings of agricultural work in 18th century England. Hello, um, I am interested in the historical meanings and experiences of work. Why work? Because I think our current society is dominated by work in very strange ways that we need to find new ways to talk about. So existing studies of work tend to be confined to urban contexts, typically artisans, early factory workers, uh, never agriculture, people who are labouring on the land. Existing studies of agrarian life rarely pose the question of work and labour as such and tend to be confined to quite uh, what I think is quite a limited analysis to maybe either just a kind of political or an economic or a social or a cultural or intellectual kind of perspective. This is partly done by maintaining a distinction from what we may <coughs> call kind of the representational and the material. So uh, two realms on one hand we have ideas and beliefs and values and symbols and on the other hand we have uh, brute kind of physical fact and causality. I want to study work as a human practice that refuses that distinction and tries to be attentive to the way that they mutually shape each other uh, to the extent that that distinction is no longer helpful. So having stated my kind of ambition, I'm going to immediately retreat from that uh, and those theoretical claims because my starting point is far more modest. Uh, I will begin with kind of large um, husbandry literature, um, very rich sources for uh, particularly kind of uh, practical farming manuals that contain a, a very interesting fusion of painfully kind of step-by-step -step guides to farming, social commentary uh, and kind of philosophical musing and you get very uh, both descriptive and prescriptive accounts. Um, from there I've tried to connect these other kind of accounts of labouring on the land such as uh, uh, Georgia poetry, economic literature, um, estate books, diaries. Um, now, the obvious criticism to this is that my approach will eventually uh, never get beyond or ultimately reduce back down to a rather familiar cultural study of the discourse of labour and husbandry manuals. This would be fine, this would be valuable, but it is my aim and intention to go beyond that as far as possible. 
I do need to, uh, I will need to, refine my project, uh, the scope of it, uh, further in a couple of ways. So firstly, what is agricultural work? Who are agricultural workers? Well, this includes a very wide range of occupations that I may need to kind of narrow down or pick some to kind of uh, compare. So we have very different forms of life between the peasant family uh, farming their own kind of land for subsistence, the young servant uh, hired on a yearly contract living in the house of their employer, and the labourer on daily wages, for example. I will also need to refine my theoretical questions a bit further to try and get an angle to kind of on, on work, on labour. Um, for example, I'm particularly interested in considering workers' bodies and minds as a site of both kind of representations and materiality. So, um, I do not expect to ever be able to complete the sentence the meaning of agricultural work was X or Y, uh, but I will uh, push the problem as far as I can. Thank you very much. Okay, up next we have Miranda Redding from King's, researching conservative non-elite groups in late 18th century moral reform. Hi everyone, um, I've just started in September, so this is very much an outline of what I'm planning to do. Um, I want to look at the intellectual basis of what might be termed conservative thought on the question of moral reform in the late 18th and early 19th century, so blasphemy, obscene literature, etc. Um, I use conservative as an, as an umbrella term for those sympathies for what's been variously termed church and king, patriotic, loyalist, supportive of the status quo and morally conservative. And what I want to research is a contribution of those below the societal elite, so the archetypal middling sort to moral reform campaigns. I want to examine how these groups sought to construct ideals and to intervene in the debates, as well as examining if the imperative for reform meant something different or presented a different aspect to those lower down the social scale. I also want to look at whether the participation of these groups affected the character and scale of the movements, and from this seek to define the rhetorical construction and the mindset and the self of moral conservatives. So I've got three main research questions so far. How did moral conservatives seek to take control of the moral reform debates and to articulate its protocols and ideas? What did the moral reform movement seek to achieve in their attempts to suppress vice? And what were the continuities and changes in moral conservatism? So my general approach to research, um, I'm aiming to explore the methods by which moral ideas and tropes circulated, so how moral conservatism was articulated. I'd then like to try and map these onto an intellectual domain to produce pictorial representation of the movement of ideas within society. I want to look at how printed material was utilised to try and instil certain behaviours and use print culture of the period to try and construct a picture of a conservative moraliser. So looking at newspapers, broadsides, pamphlets, caricatures, I'm particularly interested in consumer reaction to print, such as letters to the editor. Um, the Google engram in my diagram shows that around 1800 there's a very sharp spike in the word disgust or disgusted in books, pamphlets, newspapers, etc. So it's, it's a very pithy way of expressing distaste for contemporary morals during the period. Um, I'd also like to explore networks of moral conservatives and to build a clear picture of who they were and how they worked together. And linked to this is whether certain immoral behaviours preoccupy different strata of the middle classes in different ways. Um, this is a Cruikshank cartoon from 1800 of forestalling. Now, forestalling wasn't important to the likes of William Wilberforce, who were more interested in blaspheming and the Sabbath, etc. But it was very of interest to the lower middle class people that I want to look at in, in my uh, research. Um, I want to do this by tracking networks through different archives and collections and law records such as prosecution cases. So for example, in Vice Society prosecution, who brought uh, the prosecution and just build networks in that way. Uh, and that's roughly what I'm aiming to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we have Paul McIntyre from King's. He is attempting to uncover the political career of Sir George Harrison. In 1805, William Pitt uh, reorganised the Treasury and appointed an outsider as its first official head, the forerunner of the permanent secretary figure we now see at the head of every government department. This man was George Harrison, a barrister and tax expert, he was to do the job for over 20 years, serving five prime ministers, a period, of course, of the fiscal military state, and then its <coughs> retrenchment. In the secondary literature, there's little about him. 
And what there is, is rather ambiguous. Some see him as signalling the emergence of a modern, neutral civil service, as well as an influential advisor. But he's also characterised as a Tory. Now, the questions I'm looking at are, first, what was Harrison's identity? What did he do? How did he fit in politically, socially, culturally? What were his networks? What does the language that he and his ministers used tell us about his status and role? What did contemporaries think about him? Was he an agent of reform, or was he part of old corruption? George Kitson Clark coined a phrase, statesman in disguise, to describe some officials in later decades of the 19th century who were influential on policy and articulated their own views to Parliament and the public men like Trevelyan and Chadwick. Was Harrison an earlier version of this model? The second aim is to use the evidence about Harrison to ask some broader questions about the British state in the early 19th century, bearing in mind, of course, all the problems that go with the word state. Now, these questions need uh, refining, but, for example, can Harrison's career help us better understand how power was exercised and by whom? What does it say about the power of the Treasury? Was empire the perceived framework more than Britain? And how far does it fit in with one or more theories of state building? Now, I can see at least two risks in this project, and there may be more you can tell me about in a minute. But uh, first, there are no memoirs. And the papers that I've identified so far are scattered among those of the politicians that he worked with. And these are mainly official, not personal papers. So the question is, will this material and the other sources bear the weight of the questions? And I think the second risk is, if the project is too much of a biography, it may not lead to wider conclusions, nor contribute to current debates about the civil service. So looking at some similar figures in government might be necessary to address that problem. <laughs> 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 <laughs>